How's that? Cool. Cool. So just as an introduction, um, this panel, this talk is a bit of a follow-up to this somewhat unsuccessful panel at uh, the Fifth Hope. Um, <laughs> Shardy was there. It was, uh, we had about five of us, um, a number of people from 2600 NetIRC and just other random girls who happened to be at Hope. And we basically had this hour-long bitch session about bad experiences that the different members of the panel had had as members of the information security community, as members of the hacker community, or in computer science. And it was really cathartic for all of those of us who were involved, but it wasn't very productive. And so what I want to try and do today is offer some concrete strategies that we can use um, going forward as a community to encourage the participation of women in the open source and hacker communities, rather than just like whine about how stuff sucks because that tends to not be so productive. So the first thing I want to address is why you should care why you should care about the fact that sitting in this audience there are almost no women sitting in the audiences at all of these talks there have been very few women um, this is a problem on two two fronts in my opinion um, the first reason that you should care is about the community and the second reason that you should care relates to people outside the community um, as a community we're missing out on the participation of perhaps the next linus or you know, even Kevin Mitnick, who may be not participating because she feels maligned and not able to participate as a member of the community. Um, the flip side to that is that there are people out there who want to participate, who feel that they can't, and who are therefore missing out. As a community, we're missing out, and other people are missing out on our community. Um, my personal experience in being involved in the hacker and open source communities have been very positive and I feel like an obligation to get other people involved in this and encourage people to participate. So I think that we need to consider the possibility that we're not being true to the ideal of judging people based on their contributions of being a true meritocracy if we're not, if for whatever reason, there are no women almost that come to these conferences that participate in the community. What are we doing, what are we doing wrong and what can we do about, what can we do better? So to get briefly into the question of why there are so few women in this community, um, I've also been involved in the physics community and the computer science community academically. And I think that there's a lot of a lot of overlap of women's experience in these other communities that um, apply to the hacker and open source communities as in terms of why they haven't participated. Um, the, the biggest one historically has been a lack of role models. Um, there aren't sort of like the, the figures in the popular media in terms of who participates in our community are generally not women and that has a major impact on people's involvement and people choosing to get involved in this community. Um, there is a certain amount of, and I don't want to stress this point too much because again this gets into being negative, but there's a certain amount of bad behavior that goes on that discourages people who do get involved from continuing to be involved. And I think that that's something, that's something I'll address in terms of things to do better. But um, behavior at conferences, behavior in the workplace, that has a really negative impact sometimes on women's decision to participate or to continue to participate. And one of the really unfortunate things is that women who do choose to participate are more easily discouraged from participating than, than men, and that's, that, is, that exists as a problem both in computer science and physics and as something that has to be fought actively in, in, the, in the academy, and I think we have to fight it as well from a practical perspective. Um, they found specifically that in computer science teaching, bad teaching has a, 
has a disproportionately negative impact on women versus male students. And so when trying to get people involved in this community, that's something to consider in terms of um, when, you're, when you're teaching and introducing people how to be doing it and, and to take an active interest in, in learning te teaching methods. Um, and that, that contributes to a lot of turnover in, in the community. I, I know just from the Toronto 2600 community, the amount of turnover of women participants, even just in the two years since I've been involved, is dramatically higher than the turnover of, of male participants, even just you know, looking at people who show up at meets and attend other related events in the hacker community and open source community. So I wanted to directly go into um, what we can do about it and looking at success stories within the computer science uh, teaching establishment and also in physics and see how we can apply these directly to the hacker information security and open source communities. Um, and there's a couple of things that have worked actually really well within, can you maybe turn that down a little? Thanks. There's a couple of things that have worked really well within the, open, within the computer science teaching community. Um, there was a study that was done at Carnegie Mellon University between I think 1998 and 2003 um, and it was published in a book called Unlocking the Clubhouse Gender and Computing and in those five years they were able to bring enrollment of women from 7% to 42% and also increase the, um, the rate of completion of the program from 20% at the start to 80% which was the same rate of completion as male students. And they did that by doing a couple of very specific things that encouraged women to start the program in the first place, but also to stick with the program through the four years that it takes to get an undergra undergraduate degree. And uh, the Carnegie Mellon model has been applied successfully at other um, computer science teaching facility faculties around the world since then. Um, the really specific things that they did in terms of getting people involved were like getting people to, to start uh, to getting people to consider going to computer science as a major and which applies sort of generally to getting women involved in technology is very specific forms of encouragement and mentoring. Um, it was found through this Carnegie Mellon study that women tend to not be into technology for technology's sake but rather look to direct practical applications of technology. So when you consider that you want to like get your friend or your girlfriend or whoever using Linux rather than being like look at Linux it's really cool and open source and you should use it because it's cool which you know is true but at the same time it might be more effective to say look at you Linux is really cool you could use it to get that old junker computer in your basement working so that your kid can have a computer of their own or so that rather than having to upgrade your computer you'll be able to continue using the same one for a while you know sort of specific practical applications of computer science, information security, um, teaching people about stuff like phishing so that they can protect themselves um, rather than just like, yeah, I'm a hacker, this is really cool, you should, you should get involved. Like making, making that connection from this is an interesting field to these are the specific ways that it can be applied in the real world is the most effective way to get women involved in information security and computer science and the open source community. Um, the metaphor that they used in the uh, unlocking the clubhouse study was the idea that women don't dream in code and I thought that that was particularly um, descriptive of the difference between the idea of doing technology for technology's sake versus actually wanting to have a practical application of it. Um, having role models for for women getting involved and being able to point to specific people in the community who have been doing this for years and do an awesome job of it and saying, you know, th it's not true that there are no female hackers. There's lots of female computer scientists, Grace Hopper, Anita Borg are the two big American examples. Um, the women at Bletchley Park who create, who like helped crack Enigma and win the Second World War. Like there are historically lots of awesome examples of figures of female figures in computer science and also in the hacker community you have people like Raven Adler, Val Henson who's a kernel hacker and uh, a couple of the women in the ghetto hackers that you know there are these women out there who are role models who who exist who have who have forged the, 
the path for other women to follow. Um, and I think the, the biggest thing that we can do as a community is to hold true to the ideal of the hacker ethic that hackers should be judged by their hacking and not by their degrees or their job titles, that it's your contribution that makes the difference and that it shouldn't be assumed that when you're at a conference that you're there as somebody's girlfriend or that sort of attitudinal problems that everybody thinks that we don't do it, but maybe you need to call people on it when they do do it. So, like, and that that's really helpful. So I didn't have too much other than that to say, and I wanted to open the floor to people's comments and questions about um, other things that they think might be really positive in terms of getting women involved in this, in this field. And uh, other than that, yeah. I have a question for you. What's your question? So in this study, you said the most descriptive term is that women don't dream in code. Mm -hmm. Do you think that's because of a biological difference of how women are wired different than men, or do you think it's societal and just because of how things have been up to, the, to this point? Well, do you think that women could dream in code if they were put on an equal footing in terms of society in this field? It's a really good question, and it's one that's come up in the physics community. I don't remember the name of the, but the, uh, the dean of, I think it was Harvard, yeah, recently, Lawrence. yeah, Lawrence Summers. There's a big controversy in the physics community um, over this whole idea that maybe women are just na less naturally suited to doing hard science and physics in particular. And I think that there's a lot of that attitude within the computer science community as well. Um, in the Unlocking the Clubhouse study, which was the one at Carnegie Mellon, they found that um, there was this that a lot of women in the computer science faculty experienced. Uh, the attitude of you're only here because you're a girl, like that they had got in because of affirmative action when it was n absolutely not true and Carnegie Mellon did not do any affirmative action type admissions at the time and I don't think they do. They, they, they still don't, while, while they have changed their admission policies and that was part of what made them increase their admission to 43%, they, ha they don't actually have any traditional affirmative action type in admissions. As to the question of whether it's like whether if, if, it's, if it's a biological thing, um, I think that there's very little evidence that, that this, this difference in interest has anything to do with biology. Um, one of the things that's sort of like very first year women's studies, equity studies, is the idea that studies that show sameness in the social sciences don't get published. So you very rarely see a, a study that says, like you very rarely see published a study that says, yeah, women and men are just as good at math. You, you don't ever see that. You only ever see, because they don't, there's no public, the, the publications like Nature and stuff, they do not have an interest in publishing those studies. It's, it's a pretty well-known fact in the, res in, in the social science research community that those studies don't get published. Um, so there's a slanting towards this idea that there's a biological difference between men and women in terms of mathematical abilities, spatial reasoning, and all those things that lead into being a good computer scientist. When I, I personally don't feel that that's the case, and there's research into, um, there's a lot of research into the distribution of intelligence among men and women that show that while intelligence is distributed differently, that the average intelligence, the average man and the average woman are, have the same intelligence. There's just a different distribution along the curve. And again, that brings, into, that brings, into, that brings in questions about how we're defining intelligence and, so, and stuff that are kind of out of the scope of this argument. But I think that one of the things that I learned from this Carnegie Mellon study is that even if women who become involved in computer science or the hacker community do not dream in code, that that's, n that's not the requirement for entry. The requirement for entry is to want to learn cool stuff and do cool stuff. It's not, it's not eating, sleeping, and dreaming it. So, I, does that sort of answer your question? I, I was just curious when you stood up. Yeah, no, I, I, I definitely think that it's not, there's no biological thing about men versus women that means that there are like four women in this room, so, yeah. Hi, my name is Beth Lynn Iker. I work for Carnegie Mellon School of Computer Science, a full-time staff member. Awesome. And I'd like to say, yes, I have dreamed that I was coding. I totally have too. I've had lots of dreams that involved a lot of Tetris, <laughs> but 
<laughs> and, and, and code as well, but a but point that was made in the, um, in the Margolis study was that this was not a common experience for women, while well, it was described as a very common experience for male computer science students. So, that's cool. Though. Yeah, that was that was what was found. Okay, if, if, if that difference isn't biological, and I, and I think I agree that it isn't, um, do you have any idea of what, how that would get socialized? Um, I think it has to do a lot with the, the nurturing socialization that women go through, as opposed to the sort of the, the technical socialization that, that men go through. Um, I, I hate to always rely on the Carnegie Mellon study, but it is a really awesome study, and I would heavily suggest that anybody interested in this idea read up on it. It's actually a really good read, the, bu the book that was published out of the study. But one of the things that they talked about was the idea of the computer in the boys' room. And even in my personal experience growing up, I did not have a computer in my room. I only got my own computer when I left for university. Whereas and even within my family, as, as my, brother, my little brother has grown up, he's got his own computer now. And I don't mean that like, my parents are sexist or anything, but this is a fairly common experience for people, for, for, for young men and young women. Um, I think that that's going to be less true going forward as, I don't know, I think it, people in the States use, use AIM, like kids in the States use AIM, whereas up in, yeah, in Canada, like basically everybody under 15 is on MSN, like, as soon as they get home from school, and a lot of kids have their own computers from from a fairly low socioeconomic strata up, um, and it is being used increasingly as a social tool by kids of both genders. And I think that that's actually going to have a really positive impact going forward in terms of the like the, the involvement of men and of of women in computer science as a field. So, um, I th does that? Answer your question, I think. There was a 2001 uh, conference at Carnegie Mellon called the Girls, Women in Technology. And the point was asserted that there aren't enough cool games for young girls. Mm -hmm. And that that might have something to do with the problem. I think that that's very true. And I mean, if you think of what the games ha that have been produced traditionally for girls have been, there was a lot of like, pet simulators and there were like Barbie games and Purple yeah like and they all kind of sucked whereas like even me growing up one of the things that got me a lot into computers was like the old LucasArts adventure games these are games that are not like first person shooters I don't really like first person shooters once in a while I like to go out and like shoot lots of people on a computer but most of the time I want to play something with a really good storyline and I think that the decline in the adventure game industry you know, somebody should do a study and see if the decline in the adventure game industry has any correlation to the decline in women in computer science, because there actually has been a decline, and that's one of the... Overall, in the, the 90s and 2000s, there has been a decline in women. Since, I think, 1988 was the peak of women's enrollment in computer science in the States, and it's been downhill since then, other than at Carnegie Mellon. So... Yeah, um... Well, you know... <coughs> uh, Sorry. Making the... Assumption that is not, uh, you know, and there's no biological basis. Um, so uh, we'll let you know, using me as an example. You know, when I was six years old, my father, you know, brought home a computer, put it in the living room, and you know, I said, "Oh, hey, you know, teach me how to program." So you know, I, I practically taught myself how to program. Mm -hmm. Now my sister, um, you know, that was the year she was born. So you know, she grew up having you know the computer in the living room. But she never showed any interest in it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I'm a programmer. My brother's job is, you know, he, he programs for a living. And, you know, my sister's never shown any interest in it except, uh, you know, email. Yeah. So, um, you know, do you, do you think that, you know, it, there, there are differences in, in how, you know, my brother and I were parented versus my sister? Or just dumb luck? Or, you know... I think that it's a little bit of luck, it's a little bit of parent, it's a lot of parenting, and it's a lot of more general socialization. Um, there's been a lot of research into the way that um, gender roles for 
like career gender roles in the media impacts kids and imprinting on kids as to what kind of roles they're going to choose for themselves to go into to, to study in school and to, to to go into as a career and it's there's no one thing even if it was partly biological it's there's all these different factors that come into play in terms of career choices and choices of interest so actually sort of as a as a, a follow-up to that the um one of the things that I found the most interesting out of this Carnegie Mellon study was the idea that interest is deeply tied to confidence in a subject. Um, and the, the, the chapter on it was actually called The Nexus of Confidence and Interest. And the idea that as you become more confident in a particular discipline, a particular area of study, you become more interested in it, which I think is pretty, pretty obvious to anybody that you're good at something so you're going to become more interested in it but the flip side of that is things that break your confidence in a subject make you lose interest in it which seems kind of counterintuitive why would my not feeling good about coding make me think that I'm not interested in it but if you know if I'm feeling like I'm you know I'm really struggling I can't get Linux installed on my laptop nothing's working well maybe it's just not the right thing for me to be doing maybe I should you know go back to Windows and give up on the whole open source thing. There's, there's this really deeply tied association between confidence and interest, and because of things like poor teaching negatively affecting women more than men, and therefore destroying their confidence, they have a much higher tendency to then become disinterested, which is really just not confident. So, so I also help run a Linux users group. And I see, at, particularly at Install Fest, what will happen is a woman will come in with her um, laptop or her desktop. And all of a sudden, there's a swarm of guys who want to jump in there and get here. I'll help you. I'll help you. Away. Yeah, and take the keyboard away. And that's, I think that that's the big key for teaching. Well, it's the key for teaching anybody about computer stuff is, is to not be in the driver's seat. Um, the, I don't know how many of you are familiar with the agile programming philosophy, but one, one of the things heavily involved in that is the idea of pair programming. And in pair programming, generally speaking, the person who is less experienced is supposed to be driving, i.e. at the keyboard. And I think that that applies equally well for stuff like install fest, stuff, any sort of computer science teaching. Um, it's really, really hard to learn looking over somebody's shoulder. And, and I, I don't know if any of you have had, ever had the experience of trying to learn by looking over somebody's shoulder, but it's like, it's intensely frustrating. So that's, that's a really good point. What about like the junior high, high school level? Uh, what kind of changes can uh, be made there to encourage women to get more technical fields? Well, they found that the, the, a number of studies have been done into the into teeth, like, into, el like, uh, not secondary, but, so, prim yeah, <laughs> primary teaching methodologies and the impact on career choices and educational choices for women. Um, and even, th they found that even teachers who think that they're really good about gender in the classroom, when they actually study the numbers of times that they call on male students versus calling on female students, there'll be like this really dramatic disproportion, like this dr really dramatic skew towards male students, in particular in science and math and computer science classrooms. And so having a real consciousness of how often you're calling on students of different genders, even if there's, you know, the really enthusiastic couple of guys that sit in the front row and ask lots of questions. And sometimes you need to consciously call on the people who are less, who are less, maybe kind of meek in the background and say, I might know this answer, but I'm not going to be really confident about it. And encouraging confidence through, through mentoring and, that, and, and through active, active questioning. So those are a couple of things that have been shown to be really effective. Here's a game for women. Look, your character can run around with a bikini. Um, and I was wondering if you, see, if you see that sort of happening a little bit more broadly. The, oh, we're really trying to do this for you. We have absolutely no idea. The Lara Crofts of the, the, the Lara Croft problem, right? Yeah. Sure, she's this like awesome, empowering female character. She just happens to have like boobs that are like balloons. And 
so maybe women aren't going to be so comfortable playing with that. And it, it is really a catch-22 um, in terms of, well, maybe not a catch-22. It, it is a problem in trying to advance these role models, but then them not really being very positive role models. And I, I don't really know what the solution to that is. Other, other than, you know, keep, like, keep trying kind of thing. <laughs> I guess that's all we can really hope for. Yeah. Uh, have you found commonalities with yourself and other, and other women in the computing field that have, uh, okay. that have help, helped all of you, uh, you know, get through the, the, impediment, the impediments for being involved in that? Well, honestly, I think the biggest thing for me is I wish that I'd read this Carnegie Mellon study before I dropped out of physics, um, because the whole idea of confidence being directly tied to interest was my exact experience with second year quantum mechanics and having a teacher who didn't speak English. And I had this, like, so I had this teacher who was very well intentioned, but I just could not understand a word he was saying. And not having the confidence to go out and ask people for a lot of help on stuff that I wasn't getting. And there were just all of these different factors, which were like the classical factors of women dropping out of technical fields. And they all happened to me in second year. And if I had known about that going in, I think that would have been really empowering and probably would have allowed me to ride through it. Um, and, and I think that finding that there are these same factors that discourage women uh, from participating in th these varied fields, physics, computer science, and mathematics, I, I think that knowing some of those things going in would be really powerful for, for women participating in these fields. I, th I think that that's really true. It's it's a network effect in the same way as the the whole like adding one developer to the development team just makes it more complicated. Adding one woman to the computer science faculty to the physics faculty. There's no at the University of Toronto, which was my home institution. There were three female physics profs out of like a, a faculty of about forty, which was actually pretty high in Canada. <laughs> so it was kind of sad. And, and there, w there wasn't that mentoring and support network. Um, and, and having that in place, every, every single woman who joins this community who starts actively participating encourages other women to participate. So. Well, um, do you know how this compares to other cultures where um, you know, women are, you know, have different social roles and, and so forth? Like, um, you know, say, you know, some countries where, you know, women are allowed to, you know, combat in the military and that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Well, there's, I know from the, I know the statistics a bit better in this case in the physics community, um, but there's a number of countries in the world, like in, in Canada, at least the, part, the, the number of physics postgrads, like physics postdocs, so people who have gone through all the way to a PhD program is something like 4%. And basically in undergrad, there'll be 40%. In masters, they'll be like 30%. In, it, it, there's this idea of the leaky pipeline. At each level of academic achievement, there are few and fewer and fewer women involved in physics. The difference with Canada versus a country, for whatever reason, politics aside, Iran has something like 60% of their physicists are women. And I don't know what the reason behind that is, but what that really suggests is this isn't a biological thing, this is a cultural thing. Because if a country like Iran can have 60% of their physicists be women, there's something else going on culturally. And I think that, I'm sure that the statistics are, I, I don't know what they are off the top of my head, but I'm sure that if somebody were to look into the statistics for computer science participation across cultures, there would be dramatic differences between countries. Yeah. Cool. Did I see a hand over there? No. What can uh, peer groups like Logs and stuff do outside the high schools to encourage women participation? I think with Logs, I mean, at least from my personal experience, a lot of what needs to happen at Logs is a matter of self-policing. Um, I talked a little bit about bad behavior being discouraging for women in terms of like harassment and the whole idea of you know getting sort of swarmed when you show up. Um, there are a couple of people at the Toronto Lug who actually have made me so uncomfortable that I've stopped going. Um, one of the guys there actively talks like he heckles other presenters when they're talking and people make jokes while he's heckling about his like BDSM fetish. 
and it, you know it's it's funny and like I kind of brush it off but that makes a lot of people actively uncomfortable and so I th like I think that that's the big key for lugs is policing that like self policing that kind of bad behavior you know maybe tapping that guy on the shoulder and saying I think your jokes are making people a little bit uncomfortable can you maybe not do that so that like I it sucks to have to come out and say like tell people to not be assholes but that's a lot of what has to happen at lugs so there is a specific FAQ on the web for how to attract women to your Linux users group so mm -hmm. I suggest you check it out yeah it, it's exactly what you're saying that you need to self police it, it's not just the girls who need to speak up it's the guys who need to speak yeah. up and say you know what this is exactly why we're not getting women to come in here because you uh, want to sit up there and spout out cuss words mm -hmm. and be a rude person to not uh, not just women but to everybody and it's just annoying yeah and there's like at, at my my lug in toronto there's been a couple of there's a couple of people who will consistently heckle speakers in a very aggressive way um, and you know they're just joking around, but it, it's really it, it makes it that much harder to go up there and be a speaker. And I, like I think we do it too in the information security community at, at the hacker cons, and <laughs> and like it's really awesome that somebody like Shardy has the confidence to come up to to go up on stage and have his friends in the dr front row drinking and like heckling him, and that's totally awesome. But that does make it really hard for somebody else to come up and talk if they don't have that community network of support. And I'm not, I, I, like, and it, it's really hard because I want to find a balance between saying, no, you shouldn't do that, and here's how to do that in a way that doesn't discourage people from participating. Because that is, like, the, the drunken rowdiness is part of this culture. It is part of this community. It's part of the fun. And how do you, how do you find a balance between continuing that because it's fun and making it not hostile? So. Well, doesn't this drunken rowdiness essentially make it sort of like an old boys club, which, you know, sort of just self-perpetuates and, um, you know, the, the drunk rowdy boys can join the club and, you know, the girls just can't or, or wouldn't feel like Or have it. to be drunk and rowdy too to, to, to get into the club. And, and some people can handle that and, and some people can't. And that's a question that I, like, I thought a lot about going into this talk and was not really sort of able to come up with any conclusions um, other than call people on really egregious behavior and, uh, and self-police. I, I think that has a lot less to do with male or female, but just your own self-confidence. Mm -hmm. uh, be, being somebody who's been up there both as the person getting heckled and the heckler, I, I think it has a, lot, has a lot more to do with self-confidence than gender, which directly relates back to uh, what okay. you said before about interest versus confidence so it might not directly be a problem but indirectly it's a problem that's it's it's only a problem because we already have this existing problem of a lack of confident women hackers like that's how it becomes a problem it's not a problem in and of itself i don't i don't think it seems like there's like three stages going on here and each one i i'm not sure how any of us in this room could solve the problem. You've got the early childhood where you've got parents and teachers uh, telling girls they can't do this technical stuff. And it's not even necessarily being directly told that you can't do it. It's because just not encouraged. Right. It's, and, yeah. And then you have the lack of role models, which, of course, you're not going to have the role models unless you yeah. have people ahead of you. And then finally, you have the people misbehaving, and wow, a girl, what are we going to do? <laughs> and a, the best way to solve that is to get more women into the culture. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Uh, so you kind of have to address the first two in order to, yeah. to deal. So Which it's like um, if, if, if there were just like 50% women at this conference or at like a lug or anything, the the like oh my god let's like glom on the girls would just not happen because the, there would be lots of girls and so rather than it being this crazy ratio it, there it just that just wouldn't be the case yeah how much of the problem do you think is caused by the women uh, 
Uh, for example, at that oak panel, the posters inside the men's room. Yes. Why <laughs> Cable <hacks> flame. <laughs> why girls come to this room at this time to see why hacker girls uh, Z Z Z. Yeah. She was really trying to be funny, on. and it just really wasn't but funny. For example, the uh, yeah. kisses girl. Yeah, she's around. been at several. She was at another conference yeah, too. At Defcon, yeah, and, and somebody wrote an article on her where she made up a fake story about she was running some sort of social experiment, and then there was another newspaper story about how she was looking for money to get a bus home. She was just basically making up stories and taking in money from these poor, desperate guys who yeah. paid a dollar to kiss her. Yeah, uh, how much <laughs> it was really sad. <laughs> it was, and that, it, it made me angry when I saw it at yeah. all because. One of the smartest people in the field that I know is female, and she was just ripped. So yeah. How much of the problem do you think is caused by women's actions as opposed to the long on, hey, look, it's a cute girl, let's take the keyboard away? Yeah. I think that that's, that's another question of self policing that has to be addressed, and that I know I personally haven't been very good about addressing that, even, even confronting Cable Flame about the posters in the bathroom. Um, that as women already involved in this community, we have to be holding each other up to not to, not to good behavior, but to to encouraging each other and to encouraging other women to become involved. Um, and it becomes hard to self police when there is when it is such a minority situation that as it is right now, like I think that that's why it has been traditionally hard to self police in that respect. But I think it ha it is something that people have to people, specifically women already involved in the community, have to be conscious of. Do you, do you think there's a taboo against uh, taking the girl who's saying, oh, look at me, I'm poor and defenseless, and I don't know anything, do my stuff for me, just to get attention. Is there a taboo against... Against calling people because, on that. Oh, okay. Uh, be, because, because of the thought that any attention is good attention, even if we don't agree with her tactics, it's still getting a foot in the door? Mm. Uh, do you think that that's one of the reasons for the taboo against anger? I think, that, I think that that's definitely one of the reasons, the whole idea of not wanting to discourage even that kind of lame, I'm showing up to sell kisses participation, seeing it as still participation, even if it's not positive participation, and, and being able to call people on the fact that it's not positive. So. I'd actually like to respond to what he was just asking about with the anecdote about the, the girl who's making up all the stories and say, what about the guys who do stuff like that? The guy who, who does all the heckling in, in Toronto, there's a lot more of them, but it's it's something you're gonna experience as part of human nature, and in a situation where they're such the minority, people who might want attention or might want to abuse that attention are going to find it a very easy easy place to find it. Well, the problem is though, if you have just statistically less women, if you have one woman for every 10 guys, the woman that stands out doing that sort of bullshit story is going to be a lot more noticeable just because she stands out uh, just because of the numbers. So it's potentially more damaging. It's not worse, but it's just... I, I'm oh, I agree. I, I Self-policing is really important for men and women. Like, yeah. I was just suggesting it, it's important not to cite that as a possible cause for the shortcoming, shortfall of participation of women as a whole because there's one or well, two I'm who not say, hey, attention. That. Okay. I'm just saying that it's uh, from from what I've seen, it's something that most women I've talked to know exist, but don't want to approach because of I. It's a lose lose situation. Uh, whereas other women I know are that makes them ten times more angry than the guy that's being a misogynist asshole. Uh, the woman that is encouraging them to. So I was just wondering what yeah. Well, it's it's sort of it, it's especially hurtful when somebody is doing something like that because it's of. It's gonna be worse when it comes from within. Yeah, exactly. When it the, I, I think that the the girl doing the kissing booth at Hope and at DefCon was more hurtful to the women who actually like managed to come out and participate. All all like twenty of us at Hope, and I don't know how many women show up at DefCon, but I I've been to hacker conferences that that had under 1% participation and that's just really sad like and open source conferences astracon the asterisk conference in uh, in october there were five women of 600 attendees that's not even 1% like there's something wrong there
conferences and at these events. Mm -hmm. Because once you've got, once you have a whole bunch of women or a whole bunch of any group, it's much harder to single out one and say, oh, look, they are now representative of this very small group. Yeah. Um, so if you have 10 women and one of them is acting like an idiot and you have 500 men and 10 of them are behaving badly, it's much easier to hold the one up as the example. Um, so I think that the ultimate solution then becomes encouraging to more women to move into the field. That's back to the bootstrapping oh. mm -hmm. Hi, since we're obviously not going to solve this problem overnight, temporarily as a workaround, do you think it's a good idea um, from the mentors to say, look, these are the types of idiots you're going to encounter. Yeah. And don't let it break your spirit. And I actively do that in encouraging women to participate in lugs in different, there's so many user groups in Toronto, it's kind of ridiculous, but like, I, I, I personally go to like five different ones and will often talk specifically to the, women, the other women who show up and sort of like, oh, you're planning on going to tea lug you should totally go, but this is, don't give this guy your phone number. Like, really, really don't. He's really, really annoying. Because if she didn't know that she shouldn't give creepy stalker guy her phone number, she would get creepy stalker, creepy stalker guy would probably stalk her, and then she would not go back to T-Lug. And so, sort of like that kind of active, not, not really, yeah, I guess it's kind of warning people, but warning people as to the pitfalls of their participation it sucks that we have to do that, but it is a good first step. So, but I think I, I think that sort of like and and the conversation here has really reinforced for me that a lot of what we have to be doing is self policing, um, in terms of calling people on being assholes when it has a sp when you can see that it has a specific negative impact on people, and the lugs are a really good example of that. So, yeah. Uh, are there any, any other uh, women's organizations or computer science related for Linux Chicks or others? There's Linux Chicks. There's the, um, the Anita Borg Institute for Women in Technology. Um, I know Google does an Anita Borg scholarship. There's the Sisters, which is an email list, spelled S Y S T E R S dot org, I believe. Um, there's the Grace Hopper, I can't remember what it's exactly called, but it's like the Grace Hopper Congress of Women in Computing. And that's in uh, San Jose this year, I think. Um, the Linux chicks and the various email lists on there are awesome resources. Um, and oh, women in science and engineering. I don't know, does that exist in the States? That's pretty big in Canada, so yeah. And oh, and the various like um, institutional bodies, I know the, um, the Association for Computing Machinery has a committee on the status of women. Um, the, I don't know if it's called the Committee on the Status of Women, but they, they have a, women, uh, a women's special interest group, um, as do most of the international physical, like physics associations, and uh, like the country-specific physics associations and the international, the international Union of Applied and Theoretical Physics. I don't remember if that's the acronym, but yeah. So there are a number of groups out there. Mm -hmm. And if you do a Google search for unlock, unlocking the clubhouse, you'll find the, um, the homepage for that Carnegie Mellon study. And there's also a book that came out of it that I've even got here. And that's what it looks like. The, um, another group that I thought of is, uh, they're called the Gender Changers. Um, they do summer camps and like weekend outings that are like basically hack hacking workshops um, where they do hardware hacking, Linux install fest, that kind of thing. They're mostly based in Europe though, and Canada. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if there's any other questions or comments? Yes, there are. Okay. Well, okay. I have a, a number of hacker friends who have uh, you know, just had kids. And they're mostly daughters. Yeah. So, um, you know, would you have any advice that, uh, you know, I can relay to them, um, you know, how to raise hacker daughters? Give them a really old computer and, like, lots of Linux ISOs. Um, <laughs> and uh, generally, like, encouragement is the really big thing. Um, Talking about role models is a really important thing, um, whether it's like hacker role models or just generally computer and science 
role models like computer science and physics and all that kind of stuff. Role models about that. Um, there's, I think those are the big ones. Um, and like ac acting as a mentor for your kids or even finding like an external mentor who can, who, like if they do show, and this is, you know, this is only if they do show an interest because maybe they are really into music or something not computer related, but giving them all of the options is really the key. So. Um, also, um, you, you asked about that, um, what you tell them what to do, and I don't know if this is worthwhile or not, but I love taking things apart when I was a little kid. I mean, I'm sure all of you did. So as a dad, I can see it being second nature to go, oh, here you go, son, take this apart, you'll have fun, it's blessed, knock yourself up. And not doing that with your daughter. And just the fact that it doesn't occur to you that she might want to take it apart too. Let her I, the hell out. To the point that like, I always got in trouble for taking apart stuff when I was a kid. And like, what's gonna be more discouraging in getting involved in computer science and science in general than getting actively discouraged when you show an interest in technical things? Like that's, I think that's really the key is to, to just be encouraging. If there's any way as a society to change attitudes like that, uh, rather than like one by one, uh, parent by parent. I think that where a lot of success has happened as it, like in the larger scale has been in, in the education system. Um, the one of the things that they did at Carnegie Mellon that was that was like really intensely cool was when um, advanced placement computer science switched from Pascal to C++. They had like a summer camp for um, high school teachers to learn C++ and gender issues in computing. So they had all these high school teachers from across the states come to CMU to learn about you know sort of they, they got them in with the C++ and then they taught them about gender and computing. And subsequent to that, they had a, a dramatic increase in enrollment in uh, computer science at Carnegie Mellon, again from 7 to 42%. Couldn't that just be because the women prefer C++ to Pascal? Possibly, although I don't know why anybody would prefer C++. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, that's that, a, <laughs> a good question. Um, but it, like, I think that where there has yeah where there has been a lot of success institutionally has been in higher education. Um, as for what other sort of large social ways of changing this, I'm kind of lost on that one. I, I I honestly don't know, and I and I'm I, I lean towards the idea that there aren't that this this has to be a grassroots thing. So. Mm -hmm. you know, a lot of the times, like, uh, uh, people don't like to write about uh, yeah. uh, targets uh, certain areas like that. So. Well, yeah, and I mean, how, how well published was this Carnegie Mellon study in, tr in the popular media? Um, what resources are made available and, like, to parents to teach their daughters about technical stuff? Like, the, you know, I, I tried to give you some constructive suggestions, but I couldn't say, oh, well, you should read this book, and there's a bunch of articles about how to get your daughters into computer science. So, we, we done? Pretty much. Pretty much? Okay. Cool. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody, for participating. <laughs>